Hello, everybody. Are we excited about the new summer order? Please say yes. Okay. Don't say no or I might start crying. Okay. And this is our second quarter on the internet. It's in Zoom. And uh, hopefully uh, these biographies about Western uh, authors of Western literature you find interesting. Okay. So again, we are school, International School of the East. And this is class for July 6th, 2020, Mondays, if we were at the school. Okay. So it's Mondays, afternoons, 12.30 to 4.30 p.m. All right. And uh, does anybody know our course code? Anybody? ENG 101, Literature of the West. And today's author, because we have a lot of information about him, I'm still kind of juggling this around. Some authors don't have a lot of biographical lot of, uh, information. So I might do two authors in one week. I would like to try to only do one so you don't get confused. But this uh, author, his name is Ernest Hemingway, one of the iconic American writers of all time. Uh, he has enough biographical information here that I can uh, go over and give you enough questions that you need. But all pertinent questions, all important questions. No fluff. Have you heard the term fluff? That's a slang word that means extra material that is not important, okay? So I don't want any fluff in this. So, you know, in other words, like, uh, if this was a general history class, and you wanted information, let's say, about Abraham Lincoln, I'd have to tell you the important things, like he was born in Illinois, he didn't graduate high school, but somehow later he was able to become a lawyer, how he ran for president, he was most famous for freeing the slaves. So fluff for him would be something like, oh, you know, he liked black tea, and uh, he liked to eat pumpkin pie, or he didn't like to wear a left sock. Those things are fluff. They're not important to actually learning uh, the important accomplishments that he had or where he came from in the context for American history. So no fluff here either. Okay. And uh, this author is Ernest Hemingway. Okay. So hopefully you've uh, heard of this fellow. If not, you will know about him uh, by the end of my lecture. So again, Today is our first class meeting of the summer quarter of 2020. It's uh, July the 6th. Okay. All right. So, uh, and I'm also, I told my class uh, for the morning, due to the, some of these books are really hard. Even if I get book nook, they're really hard to match up and line up. Either the words get cut off, which I can't have for you. You have to be able to read the words or they have to be, uh, even when maximized, that you can read them. They can't be too small. So these, this book is very hard to do that. So uh, I'm going to have to, uh, I know I have, how I've minimized my face in the corner there, which hopefully nobody pays attention to. You have to read the, the literature. Uh, but it's going to have to be gone completely because I don't want it blocking anything that you can see. And then, of course, I'll have the backup book with me. If anything is blocked out at all, I'll be able to read it for you. Okay. so. Uh, these are all considerations for you students, okay? Thank you. Let's get on to the material here. I'm going to minimize our, take away, take away my face. It's going to disappear. because I'm blocking words there. 
don't want to do that. Okay, so here we go. Ernest Hemingway, 1899 to 1961. So I'm not talking to you about a writer that's 200 years old or 100 years old. Uh, when I was going to, still, going to school, he was still quite, uh, still surviving as a contemporary, but, you know, getting older. So this fellow was a novelist, so he wrote novels, short stories, and nonfiction writer. You'll find out he wrote a lot from his own experiences, and he had quite an interesting life serving in World War II, being involved in the Spanish Civil War, even though he was an American, being wounded, things like that. And it made his uh, books very, very interesting as far as the human perspective. Okay. So again, as you can see, I kind of chopped these together and that's from the, the first page. So I wanted to make sure that it was legible, and, um, you know, doing the best I can for you guys, okay? So here we go. Ernest Hemingway was perhaps America's best known and most celebrated writer. He forged a reputation, which means he strongly made a reputation as a literary icon through the use of spare dialogue and straightforward prose often turning to his dramatic life, as I mentioned, as a sportsman and adventurer for inspiration. Okay, so let me get into some of the vocab here. Uh, if we don't know the term icon, you can be an icon in many fields. You can be an icon as an actor, a uh, sports player like uh, Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant, or an actor like a Robert De Niro. And what it means is that you were so popular, so good at what you do, so many people look up to you. Uh, not a one hit wonder, not a one year wonder person, but over a period of time that people look at you on a, like you're number one, or you're on the highest level and you become an icon. So he, he became an icon in America as a literary a writer. Now, these are techniques that he used. Spare dialogue. So some writers write a lot of fancy dialogue, which can be very confusing or stray off the point because they're using very colorful language. But uh, in his writing, he used spare dialogue or a minimalist approach. It made it that most people could understand what he was writing about. And then that went hand in hand with a straightforward prose or uh, the rhythm of his writing was just straightforward and to the point. Uh, often turning his dramatic life as a sportsman. Okay, so uh, inspiration means his experiences as a soldier, as a medic, as a hunter, he hunted a lot. His travels all over the world, they inspired him to create these interesting characters. And as we shall see, Hemingway liked to portray soldiers, hunters, bullfighters, you know, the guys that have the red cape originally from Spain and they say, Tora, and then Ole, and the bull comes through, passes by the gate, hopefully not putting a horn in the bullfighter's stomach and others whose courage and honesty clash with the ways of modern society and who in this confrontation lose hope and faith. So that's very interesting. That's almost like a kind of like a Jesus uh, comparison. So these characters, again, whether they're soldiers, hunters, bullfighters, they have courage and honesty because you do, take, you do need courage to fight a bull or to be a soldier. But they clash or 
go against the ways of modern society and who in this clash or confrontation, it makes the characters lose hope and faith. Remember, uh, Jesus wept and cried before he was to be hung on the cross and had lost hope and started to pray to God. So among Hemingway's famous novels were The Sun Also Rises, 1926, A Farewell to Arms, 1929, For Whom the Bell Tolls, 1940, and The Old Man and the Sea, 1952. Uh, most of these books have been made into movies. So uh, it's a great joy in reading the book, but if you also see the movie, you can compare it. And I've seen the ones that have been made into movies, which are Farewell to Arms, uh, From the Bell Tolls and The Old Man in the Sea. Quite good. Hemingway was a winner of both the Nobel Prize, so we know that's given to scientists and people involved in peace, and the Pulitzer Prize, which is the highest award for writers. Uh, Ernest Hemingway was born on July 21st, 1889, in the village of Oak Park, Illinois, to Clarence Ed, his nickname, Hemingway and Grace Hall Hemingway. He was the second of Hemingway's four girls and two boys. So uh, children were six. Hemingway's father taught him to fish and hunt as a boy along the shores and in the forest surrounding Lake Michigan. And he developed an early appreciation for nature. It would become the touchstone of his life and work. So 99% of those words, we know what they are, but I bet you don't know touchstone. Touchstone means the most important center uh, point of uh, someone's life, touchstone. For some, for some people, it's the family. For some people, it's your religion. Some people, it's your job. Oak Park was mainly Protestant. That is a form of Christianity. Upper middle class suburb of Chicago that Hemingway would later refer to as having wide lawns, and those are the, just the grass in front of your house, and narrow mines. So people had large yards but he felt they had narrow minds. Okay, I'm gonna to have to continue. This is all on the same page. All right. He would attend concerts and operas in Chicago and visit art museums with his mother, a musician and artist. Both parents and their nearby families fostered or believed in the Victorian and Midwestern values of the time of that era. Religion, family, work, and discipline. So no being without a job. No not going to school if you can go to school. And that also means there was no homeless problem at that time. People had a different way of thinking about things. At Oak Park and River Forest High School, Hemingway was a Medicore athlete. So Medicore means kind of like low level. So he was not an athletic uh, young man. And concentrated instead on writing articles, poems, and stories for the school's publications largely based on his own experiences. And now we're gonna to go to the bottom of the page, our first page, which we're going along at a pretty fast rate here. Trying to slow it down, but we'll get there. After Hemingway graduated from high school in 1917, 
Did anybody here graduate from high school in 1917? I graduated in 1918, believe me. Uh, he did not go to college as his parents expected, but took a job as a reporter for the Kansas City Star. So parents wanted him to go to college, but he took a job with a newspaper. In the short time he worked at the newspaper, he learned some stylistic lessons that would later influence his fiction, meaning fiction writing. The newspaper advocated, or their style was, short sentences, short paragraphs, active verbs. Remember, verbs show action, and he wanted even more as active verbs. Compression, which means to push things together. Authenticity, so authenticity is a form of Honesty, right? Just like when we talk about here, you know, on a silly end, we want authentic food. So if you go to Taco Bell, that is not authentic Mexican food. Just ask a Mexican from Mexico and they will tell you. Or my Chinese students, if you tell them the best Chinese food is Panda Express, they will probably start screaming. So. You also need authenticity in writing. So he was not one to make up exaggerated stories or lie. Clarity, again, goes hand in hand. Clear purposes in the writing. And immediacy. So usually in the immediate time, he would not be writing about 100 years ago like King Arthur. All right, that brings us to the bottom of the first page here. So let me get the book out of the way, my backup system. So you know I have to go to the uh, whiteboard. Okay. okay, whiteboard. All right, where's that pencil? So I'm gonna go into my first question. So again, don't worry if my questions can be a little long sometimes, you usually get a short answer. So I do more writing than you. I don't know why I went to capital there. What's going on? It's haunted, it's a ghost. Okay, so there's question one. Hemingway forged reputation. There, let me add it. I missed an article. Uh, Hemingway forged a reputation as a literary icon by what? If you're confused by that question, all I'm trying to ask here is what were his techniques? Right? His techniques are what made his writing uh, acceptable and later became famous. So he became this icon by using which techniques? So that'll be your answer for that. All right, question two.
think I'm missing a letter here. Get this correct. Yay. Okay, question two. Um, what kind of characters did he like to portray? The meaning of that sentence, if it's not clear to you, means what kind of characters did he like to write about? Okay. Uh, did he like to write about cowboys? Did he like to write about the kung fu masters? Did he like to write about musicians? There's certain types of characters that reappear in his different books over and over. So just give me the small list. So remember, if you've been a student of mine before, um, if you only give me one, you're not gonna get the same amount of points as someone that gives me two or three. So that's the usual thing. Okay, so on to question three. Where's that pencil? Why not? Okay. Pretty you still my pencil? Look at that writing. One small case in the rest capital. The hoppa. Okay. Okay, three. This is be pretty good question. It influences his writing as you're learning about him. Nature meant what to him? Okay, what did it mean to him? Again, if you want some kind of a hint, I can tell you that uh, I lived off and on between Los Angeles and Seattle for quite a number of years. And when I was in my 20s, uh, Seattle is a city that has a lot of beautiful nature, beautiful mountain, Mount Rainier, lakes that turn into the ocean, very, very green. And, oh, just can't beat it in the summer for its beauty. But as I, as I was in my 20s, when I first moved there, I never even realized those things existed. So nature didn't mean too much to me. I was going to the nightclubs all the time and chasing pretty girls and watching sports games. And then when I went over to live there in my 30s, suddenly one day I'm driving on the freeway to go to work and I realized, my God, not right here. It's beautiful, proud. And then, not like LA, but here in Seattle, this beautiful, the sound and the Lake Washington that goes into the ocean. This is all part of the downtown experience. So. Nature started meaning more to me at that point. So three, what did nature, and it talks about it here. We read it, mean to Hemingway. Remember, it influences uh, the scope of his writing. So the last question on this first page. Yeah, I think I'm gonna have to do a little writing here. Okay. Okay, so the last uh, question for that page. After he graduated high school, what did he learn from working at the Kansas City Sun newspaper? If you remember, the things he learned there were techniques that he used 
all through his writing. So this was uh, experience at the Kansas City Sun formed the foundation for his uh, writing technique. Okay, so I'll give you a few minutes to write those down in case you've been sleeping or you're doing the old candy crush, like I say. So go ahead, write those down. And because uh, I don't want you to say, oh, you erased those before I had a chance to do that. So go ahead. Okay, you got those? You're gonna let me uh, get the eraser here? Okay. All right, eraser already saw. Okay, here we go. Number one, repeating. Hemingway forged or built a reputation as a literary icon by what? What were his techniques? Okay. Two. What kind of characters did he like to portray? Three, nature meant what to him? Four, after he graduated high school, what did he learn from working at the Kansas City Sun newspaper? That's important, he learned certain things that uh, molded his writing style for the rest of his life. Okay, so four is gone. And, uh, let me go back to the, which should be page two. All right, so just making sure we're at where we're at. So we went to the bottom here immediately, or I mean immediacy, and that ends uh, page one. And up here on the top where it says Hemingway later said, that'll be starting page two. Okay. Hemingway later said, those were the best rules I ever learned for the business of writing. So that doesn't mean business, that's an old term that just means for the way of writing. I've never forgotten them and it shows in his writing. After the United States entered World War I, which anybody know World War I was 1914 to 1917? Hemingway tried to enlist in the army when he turned 18. Although he was deferred because of poor vision, so deferred means he was not accepted as a soldier. I guess his, I don't know exactly what was wrong with his vision, but it wasn't up to the medical standard. Uh, my grandfather on my father's side tried to enlist in World War II, but uh, was turned away because he had flat feet. So there's all kinds of medical conditions for where they could not accept you. But he was accepted by the Red Cross as an ambulance driver. So you know he's gonna be picking up wounded and dead soldiers. Quite a scary experience, but he wanted to be involved in the war effort somehow. Only a few weeks after arriving in Europe, Hemingway was wounded near the Italian-Austrian front by fragments from a mortar shell. So uh, a mortar is like a missile, or if it was on a submarine, a torpedo. So he wasn't hit by the 
directly by the mortar shell. But when it exploded close to him, the pieces of metal fragments flew and hit him in the body and cut into his body. His subsequent recovery, meaning his later recovery, at a hospital in Milan, which is in Italy, including falling in love with his nurse, an older woman named Agnes von Kurowski, inspired his first widely successful novel, A Farewell to Arms. And from what I understand, reading a lot of uh, soldiers' biographies, this was quite common where wounded soldiers would uh, you know, fall in love with the nurses who took care of them or possibly saved their lives. It's quite romantic. Samujin, are you romantic? I'm gonna ask Tal. Okay. okay, so we're in the midpoint of the second page. Hemingway had difficulty adjusting to Oak Park upon his return from the war and could not decide on a vocation. Vocation is a big word meaning job. And even to this day, soldiers usually, once they've been in war and the terrible things that they saw, or if they were also injured, they have a hard time readjusting to regular society. And he also could not find a job. Eventually, began working for the Toronto Star Weekly, another newspaper, and moved to Chicago in 1920. There he met and fell in love with Hadley Richardson. They married in 1921, and that same year, Hemingway accepted an offer to work with the Toronto Daily Star as its European correspondent, which means they were going to send him back to Europe and he would write stories from Europe. He covered the Greco, meaning Greece, Turkish war, and wrote lifestyle stories about bullfighting, social life in Europe, and fishing. Hemingway and his wife became the parents of a son, Jack, in 1923. While based in Paris, Hemingway met some of the most prominent, which means important or famous, writers and artists of his day or era. Among them were avant-garde writers, such as Gertrude Stein, Ezra Pound, whose spare literary style Hemingway sought to emulate. So the meaning of sought to emulate means, I can tell you, he wanted to mimic their style. He really liked the spare literary style that they wrote in. He believed that omitting the right thing from a story could actually strengthen it. Omitting means to leave out. So um, a lot of my students uh, get confused with this. So I'll tell you something right now that'll hopefully uh, drive it home. If you, let's say, you know, you guys get your license, you've been here a short time and you get your driver's license uh, that very, okay, so all my young guys, you get that very first speeding ticket. If you go to traffic school, pay for traffic school, and complete traffic school, that ticket will be omitted or left out from your driving record. So um, you apply for a job and they Say, well, you're going to do some driving for us of the company car, but if you have any speeding tickets, you won't get the job. So it'll be in the computer for the DMV, but the printout, it will be omitted, and then you can get that driving job. So 
again, he believed that leaving out or omitting the right thing from a story could actually strengthen it or make it better. Okay. Uh, Hemingway also began a friendship with F. Scott Fitzgerald, who's also a famous writer, when the two met in Paris in 1925. Fitzgerald, already an established novelist, as you see, introduced Hemingway to his editor, Max Perkins, helping to launch his career. Launch means to start. Although their writing careers followed divergent trajectories, okay, hard words are right. Uh, it just means different paths. The writers maintain an affection for each other despite their rivalry and forged what is now considered one of America's most famous literary friendships. So you got the word rivalry. Uh, sports is full of rivalries. Yeah, if you're from LA and you like the Lakers, it means you probably hate the Boston Celtics. If you're a Dodger fan, uh, our closest rival is San Francisco. Usually the Dodgers and the Giants don't like each other, right? And from what I've heard, Beijing people and Shanghai people have a rivalry and possibly in Korea, Busan and Seoul have a rivalry, okay? But they respected each other. It brought out the best in them, even though their writing styles were different. Uh, Hemingway produced some of his most important works between 1925 and 1929, including the landmark short story collection, so that's a series, in our time, uh, printed in 1925, which contained Big Two-Hearted River, among other famous short stories. Hemingway then released The Sun Also Rises and another book of short stories, Men Without Women. It sounds like a book about my life, Men Without Women. Okay. And then it says, The Sun. So that means we're at the bottom of the second page. Let me push this aside. Go to the whiteboard. Get the pencil before my students steal it. Okay, so we're ready for question five. Okay, five. What did he call these things he learned? So I might have some students say, what are you talking about? What things? Huh? Okay, five. Uh, we just finished the first set of questions for the first page. And five is connected to question four. I'm sure you have it but I will read it for you again. After he graduated high school, this is question four. What did he learn from working at the Kansas City Sun newspaper? So once you have that answer of what he learned, then five is the next step. So what he learned, what did he call those things? He had a special term for what he called them. So there you go, now you understand the meaning of question five, okay? Any 
going to say. Six, what was the name of his first widely successful novel? Just supply me with the name, not necessarily what it's about. Just give me the name of uh, his first widely successful novel, or as my Korean students say, novel, right? and we'll be okay there. Okay, you ready for seven? Seven Eleven? Or as they used to say in the TV commercials in Japan, seven eleven ikebon. Right, if you're from Japan, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, I used to watch Japanese television. He's gonna get a long word here. Oops. Okay, several. When he was a correspondent in Europe, which we talked about, who did he meet? Uh, the hint is that he met some famous people, but what kind of famous people did he meet? Uh, and it listed their names. So did he meet, this is during World War II, so. Did he meet Winston Churchill, Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Benito Mussolini? Were those the people that he met? Am I giving you all four answers? Uh, I am giving you the answers, if you believe me. But most of my students that know me don't believe me. So you can find them there. Uh, and then the last one for this page to be eight. Iris. Oops. I'm missing a T. There we go. Okay, this is a little bit into his thinking. What did he believe could actually strengthen a story? Maybe it's not what traditional writers believe, maybe it's different. This will key you into his kind of thinking. So, as I said before, I'm going to give you some time to, and to write these down, at least these four. So, go ahead, uh, erase them sooner than you can write them down. And I'll just mark off that I asked you these.
Okay, take your time if you have to erase. That's why I recommend using a pencil because if you write something wrong, you can erase it. Uh, but I know that's old school. Most people write with a pen, but when they make mistakes, they have to scratch it out with black or blue and it looks not too neat. Okay, did you write those down? I shall repeat them before I erase them. Where is that eraser? Maybe Inky's hiding it from me. Okay. Five. What did he call these things he learned? And remember, this is connected to question four. The last of the questions on the first page. So I shall repeat it. Question four. After he graduated high school, what did he learn from working at the Kansas City Sun newspaper? But once you have that, then five is easy. What did he call these things he learned? Well, let me erase that. Six, uh, what was the name of his first widely successful novel? Was it Charlie Brown? Is that the name of the novel? Peanuts? All right, seven. Again, when he was a correspondent in Europe, who did he meet? Babe Ruth, the king of uh, Russia? No, maybe not. And eight, what did he believe could actually strengthen a story? So remember there, it might be the opposite technique of what most writers believe in, okay? All right, so let's move on. All right, uh, let me get the book as a backup. Don't want to get us lost here. So we, again, the story of my life, Men Without Women, 1927. So it's time to move on. It says the sun here on the bottom. So the sun also rises. Introduce the world to the lost generation. Now that doesn't mean people were lost, okay? Uh, and was a critical and commercial success. So I'll read a little more, then I'll give you a little insight, information into that. Uh, Gertrude Stein coined the term or made the term, has nothing to do with money, coins. Lost generation in reference to the intellectuals Writers, uh, intellectuals are people with a lot of uh, education, maybe doctorate degrees. Uh, writers and artists who rejected the values of post World War I America and moved to Paris to live as Bohemians. Uh, I wonder if you guys at your age know what the word Bohemian is. Right. I, I know some of my recent students, like a lot of ladies, they just think this has to do with the dressing style. But the true bohemian it has a way, a philosophy of thinking about the world. It's not just a dress style. Oh, I might dress very bohemian. But are you a bohemian? Huh? What does that mean? So, again, to try to bring this home in a more uh, current stage. Anytime you have a society, and here we're talking about American society. If you remember, I, I stated earlier, he came from a background where people believed in family, church, uh, hard work, and discipline, right? That's why he, he had the discipline already. He tried to go in the army. It wasn't going to be a big thing for him. If you're a lazy person and you get in the army, it's going to be hard because they force the discipline on you. So anytime a segment or a group of society decides we don't like how the society lives, again, going to church, being strong with family, having discipline, you know, rules. Uh, people go to the other extreme. So these people actually moved from Paris 
uh, I mean, from America to Paris and lived as Bohemians. So they didn't want to dress like Americans. They didn't want to go to church. They wanted to smoke all day or drink and get drunk. That's what they wanted to do. And they didn't want to nine to five jobs, right? They wanted to write or be artists and be free. So what I can compare that to uh, now, the most uh, current, if you're keeping up on what's going on in Seattle, and what is called the, originally was the Chaz, it now became the CHOP. If you see the people that were living there, uh, mostly young people, you know, 90 something percent young people, and they're very bohemian. They don't want to have a job. And you see a lot of them, they were just smoking marijuana and then passing out during the day and at night, uh, hitting the plastic containers as drums and dancing and playing basketball. So they lived as a Bohemian and didn't want to go by the rules of society. Like you, you young man, you should be in college trying to get a degree or working hard, saving money. Maybe you should think about getting married and having a wife or do you go to church? They don't want anything to do with that. So the main part of society will call them the lost uh, generation, right? When you get older, you realize you can't just be drunk all day or play basketball and party all night because you're not saving money to buy a home or having money in the bank to get married and plan for your future. So again, the lost generation and that repeats itself in society. Uh, so the book uh, set in Paris and Spain, the book was a story of unrequited love against a backdrop of bars and bullfights. So unrequited love means he loved someone and she did not return the love for him. So it's a sad story. In the meantime, Hemingway's personal life was troubled, similar to the book, right? He divorced his first wife in 1927 and married fashion reporter Pauline Pfeiffer later that year. The couple moved to Key West, Florida, where they would live for nearly 12 years. I don't know if any of you have been to Key West. That is another area for many, many years now that is a very bohemian area. And the people that are lucky enough to live there, uh, well, I'll give you an example. Uh, many years ago, when I first started teaching in Koreatown, I had a Japanese student that was from uh, Osaka, and he was a businessman. He had saved money to come to the United States and study English and take some time here. And he told me his life was very set. He'd have to spend many hours waiting for trains, standing in line, working all day, coming home to a very tiny apartment and basically repeating the thing. I think he said at that time in Japan, businessmen work six days a week. Not a lot of time for enjoyment. And the first time he went to Key West, which is, you know, at the end of Florida, there's some islands out there. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. He saw some American men that just slept till 12 noon, drank margaritas all day, lied on the beach and went fishing. And this made him so angry, he started to cry because he compared it to his busy and controlled life in Japan. Thought about becoming a Bohemian himself. So he and his new wife, Pauline, would live for nearly 12 years in Key West. Hemingway spent his time writing and fishing, which was a source for much of his later writing. That same year, Hemingway's father 
who was suffering from physical ailments or physical sicknesses and having financial problems committed suicide. So I'm sure that greatly affected Hemingway when his father committed suicide. He had shot himself in the head. Gosh. Uh, Pfeiffer, meanwhile, gave birth to the first of their two sons. A Farewell to Arms was published in 1929 to a level of critical acclaim, which means critical success, that Hemingway would not see again until 1940. So 1929, he got very, very famous and then kind of did not get the same kind of fame for 11 more years. With the publication of his Spanish Civil War novel, For Whom the Bell Tolls, A Farewell to Arms, which is considered one of the best novels to emerge from or come from World War I, was about a US ambulance officer's disillusionment in war. So you see, he was a ambulance driver. So he took the experiences and put them in a book. A disillusionment means you're, you have stopped believing in something. And a lot of soldiers will tell you that when they were young, they were very excited and wanted to fight and be involved in war, but after serving as a soldier for a number of years, they thought differently and were not happy with the situation at all. And they were disillusioned. Uh, his role as a deserter and the romance between him and his nurse. Okay. I've had funny students try to say, his role as a deserter? Did he make apple pie and cake? No, that's a desert. Uh, a deserter is, and this is in every country in the world. I could be, uh, let's say I'm a soldier in North Korea. If you remember the case a couple of years ago where the North Korean soldier ran across to the south side, even though the North Korean so uh, soldiers shot him maybe five times, uh, he survived. But so when you run away from your duty as a soldier in any country and escape, you are called a deserter, okay? Hemingway went from being an unknown writer to being the most important, listen to that, the most important writer of his generation in just four years. That's pretty impressive. Hemingway then entered an experimental phase that confounded critics, but still, to some extent, satisfied his audience. Okay, so there's a big word there. Confounded. Confounded means beyond confusing. Like you just, some people can't be confused and they say, well, I understand why. This is confusing, but when you're confounded, you just have no idea why somebody did this. And then it says, to some extent, this still satisfied his uh, readers, his audience. This happens a lot with musical people and uh, actors. So I'll try to make this as clear as possible. For example, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the uh, actor uh, uh, Jim Carrey. Okay, uh, when he first got famous, and he was extremely famous, he made really, really silly movies. That they just weren't straight comedies, but they were silly. So I guess his agent or People in Hollywood talked to him and said, hey, you know, why don't you show your range as an actor and try to do some serious 
movies. So he did, but the audiences hated him. They were not used to him being serious. They wanted that silly, silly guy from The Mask or Ace Ventura. So that's what happened here. The critics said, what is this new experimental different style of writing? Uh, and they were confused as to why. So continuing, among the works he published in this phase were his 1932 Spanish, and then let me continue here. Okay. Um, Spanish uh, Civil War fiction bullfighting dissertation. Uh, after growing, I'm sorry, and death in the afternoon. So dissertation is a long writing, a long, long writing. After growing success with his groundbreaking style, so groundbreaking is a high level word for saying new and inventive style of writing. Because remember, he went to an experimental phase. Hemingway turned to writing for causes, including democracy, um, democracy as he knew it during the Spanish Civil War and World War II. Uh oh, I think the police are coming after Temujin again. You better run, Temujin. Inky's got a fast car. Uh, Monk Bayard can drive it. The Hemingways traveled to Africa, meaning he and his wife, uh, for a big game safari in 1933. So safari is where you hunt animals. Mostly people hunt uh, lions, elephants. Hemingway spent three months testing his hunting skills against some of the biggest and most dangerous animals. Are they getting close, that would then better run. Oh, oh, they're here for, oh, Titan, okay. Dangerous animals on earth. Hopefully, Titan, you're not stealing cars again. In 1935, he published Green Hills of Africa, a pseudo nonfiction account of his safari in which he harshly criticized his supposed friends while portraying himself as courageous and skillful. So that means he wrote bad things about his friends, he criticized them. But when writing about himself, he was obviously uh, courageous and skillful, right? So again, he started writing for causes, not for just entertainment, but to try to say, I believe in this, I don't believe in that, right? All right, so as a bottom of skillful, that means we're at the bottom of page three. Okay, that means it's back to the whiteboard and question time. Pencil. Paul, can you keep my pencil for me? Thank you. Okay, so this will be question nine. Whoops, I don't want that there. Oops. Okay, there we go. Oops, I did a capital or I should have to the small case.
Okay, question nine. What did his work, The Sun Also Rises, introduce to the world? Okay. It introduced something, remember, talk to about a certain group. Yeah. And then you'll see 10 is connected. Oops, where's my pencil? I think Mr. Hong took my pencil. Alex, oops, I don't want equals. Again, it's connected, what? Was it? Okay, so let me explain this one. Once you tell me what was introduced to the world by Mr. Hemingway in nine, then you have to explain it in 10. What was this? Thing? Give a little description of what he introduced to the world. Okay. So let me go to 11. Okay, 11. What was the name of his novel about the Spanish Civil War? What was the name? Was it called Enchiladas? Was it called Tacos? Or maybe Burrito? What was the name of his novel? about the Spanish Civil War. And then let me give you the last question for this page. And last question for page three. What later confounded or utterly confused his critics? There's something he did that his critics were really, really confused about. So again, you have four here and I'll give you a little bit of time to write these down and I'll mark off that I asked you these questions, okay? Okay, you got those down? As I erase, let me repeat. Let me go to the eraser. Nine, what did his work, meaning the book, The Sun Also Rises, introduce to the world? Introduce a certain group, right? What was the name of that group? 10, and what was it? So once you know who the group is, and I have to explain what the meaning of the group was. 11, what was the name of his novel about the Spanish Civil War? Again, I might go with uh, enchiladas. 
not Chipotle. And 12, what later confounded or really, really confused is critics. All right, so let's go back and dig into this biographical material. And like I said, we finished with skillful here on the bottom. So let me go to the top right up here. Okay. Uh, from the same safari, and again, a safari is where people pay money to go hunt certain wild and dangerous animals. Uh, Hemingway gathered or acquired the material for two of his finest short stories, The Snows of Kilimanjaro and The Short Happy Life of Francis Macomber. In The Snows of Kilimanjaro, a dying writer laments or is sorry or sad about the talent he wasted through drink, women, and laziness. Okay, reminds me of uh, Saba Saba. Hemingway seemed to allow the more negative details of his life to show up in his fiction. Remember, fiction writing is something that's not necessarily true. You can make it up. Whereas he portrayed or showed himself as heroic in his nonfiction, and nonfiction is supposed to be 100% true. Continuing in the middle of the page, Hemingway traveled to Spain in 1937 to cover the Spanish Civil War for the North American newspaper Alliance. So again, the correspondent. And worked alongside a young writer named Martha Gellhorn. They had met in Key West and had an affair. Oh, scandal. For almost four years before Hemingway divorced his wife and married Gellhorn. Bootcamp. They moved to Havana, Cuba. And remember, at this time, Cuba was not communist. And uh, in fact, at this time, Cuba, for uh, movie stars and rich people, uh, Havana, Cuba was considered uh, the Latin Las Vegas. Hemingway's reportorial, which means reporter style, experiences covering the Spanish Civil War were used to write the four, excuse me, to write the novel For Whom the Bell Tolls, 1940. The book was a huge success, both critically and commercially. So that means critics liked it, the fans liked it, and it made a lot of money. Though unanimously voted the best novel of the year by the Pulitzer Prize Committee, it was vetoed for political reasons by the conservative president of Columbia University. No prize was awarded that year. That's too bad. It's a great book. Hemingway then covered World War II in Europe, where he met another woman, Mary Welsh. He was popular with the ladies, I guess. He divorced Gellhorn to Mary Welsh in 1941. In the years following World War II, many critics say Hemingway's best writing was over or finished. But he surprised them all by publishing a novella, The Old Man and the Sea, 1952, a critical and commercially successful story about a poor Cuban fisherman's struggle to land a great fish. The novella won him the Pulitzer Prize in 1952. Two years later, he received the Nobel Prize. Yay. And uh, now we're going to the bottom of the page. Physical ailments caused in part by two small plane crashes in Africa, as well as alcohol abuse, took their toll on Hemingway, which means they started destroying his body. Despite his difficulties, he continued to work on his memoirs or biography. 
which would be published in 1964 as titled A Movable Beast. Hemingway would not live to see the success of this book, which critics praised for its tenderness and beauty and for its rare look at the expatriate lifestyle of Paris in the 1920s. If you don't know the term expatriate, uh, expatriate means a group of people that leave one country and go to live in another and they get together you know, like as a group of Americans that were living in Paris at that time in the 1920s. There was a control in his writing that had not been evident or observed in a long time. Hemingway and his wife had moved to Ketchum, Idaho, but he was suffering from severe depression that eventually led to electroshock therapy. That's where they Connect wires to your head and send bolts of electricity. Very painful. But that was considered popular at the time as a treatment. Okay. One of. So this brings me to the bottom of the last of the large pages. And it means I have to go to the last set of questions. onto the whiteboard, get that pencil. Okay, question 13. Okay, 13, how did he portray himself in his fiction and nonfiction writing? I think I need an R here. This is not portray, it's portray. Okay. So the only hint I'll give you there is that you know he portrayed himself differently in one as to the other. Okay, so not the same. That's the only hint I can give you there. Fourteen. Which of his novels won the Pulitzer Prize? So only one of his won the Pulitzer Prize, highest award in literature. Just give me the name and we'll be fine. Okay, you ready for 15? If you're not, I am, okay? So we're winding down here. We're doing a good job for the first week. And I guess I will only give you three here. Wow, too kind. Okay, so the last question for this page. Uh, what was the name of his memoirs in 1964? Had a very unique kind of name. Okay, and if you're like, teacher, that's a weird spelling, memoir. It's a French word. It's a French word we borrowed into English. So that's why it doesn't look like an English word because it's not. So let me give you a few minutes to copy those down and I shall write down that I asked you these questions. And again, these are the last questions of 
a long page. We only have a very short half page next and we'll be done, okay? And I should have to consider, should I give you one more question or be kind and just read and let you go? I don't know. Let's see, I haven't received any donations. Uh, so uh, I think you've had time. So let me repeat these as I erase them. I'll get the eraser. All right, 13. How did he portray himself in his fiction and nonfiction writing? So again, he portrayed himself one way in fiction and a different way in nonfiction. Those are the big hints that I can give you. Okay. 14. Which of his novels won the Pulitzer Prize? So only look for one. And 15. What was the name of his memoirs in 1964? So it had a very unique name. I'll give you a hint. Sounds like something to do with eating. Okay. Thank you. All right. So let's go back for our last basically half of a page only. So as I remember, we ended with down here electroshock therapy and then one of. You can see how short this is. Wow, it's, not, it's less than half of a page. Okay, again, I'm being too kind as usual. Uh, the side effects of shock therapy is memory loss. And without his memory, Hemingway could no longer recall the facts and images he required to write. So just think about that. Uh, you don't have the memory to create characters or even remember things in your own life, or as my Korean students say, shime, uh, then you can't write. It's impossible, right? I mean, writers already suffer from something called writer's block, and that's when they're all mentally okay and they're young. So I don't like this shock therapy. And as you will find out, it was banned. They no longer did it. He found it was more dangerous than beneficial. So ending up the uh, reading here, the memory loss exacerbated. Oh boy, that's a medical term you might hear from your doctor if you have something wrong with you. Exacerbated means just, it's like saying accelerated, made it go faster. The effects of his lifelong depressions, he suffered from depression a lot. Illnesses, and uh, you know he had those accidents and was also wounded in the war. Uh, he was gripped by paranoia. So paranoia means you overly worry about something that's not true. You know, like people saying, "Oh, I think there's a bird outside my window and it wants to come in and eat my shoes." Like that's not reality. But when people have paranoia, they think of strange things. And he threatened suicide on many occasions. Remember, his father had committed suicide. On July 2nd, 1961, I'm sad to say, he shot himself, ending his life in Ketchum. If you remember, that's in Idaho. There's also a Ketchum, Alaska. He was 61 years old. His novel, True at First Light, was edited by his son, Patrick, and published posthumously in 1999. When you hear something was published posthumously, it means after the death of the person. And this usually happens with uh, book writings, music. So we know that Prince died, I think last year, but maybe he was working on an album and then he died, he wasn't able to finish it. If they release it later, his album will be released posthumously. Okay. And that's it for our complete writings. So, and we're right at the end of our time limit. So I guess I'll be kind and not ask the last question. I actually had a question for this very short, but you've been good. I've given you 15 questions so far. I'm sure you're tired. Um, so we've answered all from the long pages. We're at the end of our time limit. So 
thank you for choosing my class this quarter. And uh, I guess that's it for today. And we shall meet again next week with a whole new author from a completely different background. Okay. So I shall see you.